Hello, this is Debbie McAllister, and this is Light Up Your Worth. I'm so excited for today's guest, and I know you're going to be too, as I bring on Jill. And Jill's background is after 22 years in public education, she decided to use her master's degree and teaching experience to become an author, speaker, and an empowerment mentor. She has just published her first memoir under her pen name, and the book is entitled When the Apple Falls Far from the Tree, isn't that intriguing, which outlines a lifetime of challenging situations and the tools she used to make it to the other side of adversity. From growing up in a chaotic, in a house of violence, to cancer recovery, multiple weight loss surgeries, and a newly sober lifestyle, Jill feels compelled to share her resources with others who seek personal growth and improvement. She's the creator of the blog site, justbeingjill.com, where followers can find motivation and inspiration for everyday real life connections. Welcome, Jill. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I am. I'm just really excited um, to have you on and have us talk about the other thing it was that I did point out was that you have a, a podcast that's going to be in the works and probably by the time this is published, it will might just be live. And so if it is, I'm going to mention it in and put it in the show notes so that everybody's aware of it as well. So welcome, just being Jill. <laughs> glad to be here yeah what a catchy name I mean really is uh I mean I instantly think of just being Jill and I instantly think of like self-acceptance absolutely just being Jill authentically Jill yeah that is absolutely beautiful and I know one of the things that we wanted to um dive into today is we wanted to talk about what you know defining what self-loyalty is and what that, what does that really entail? What, what is that? I'll just start there. What is All right. self-loyalty? Great too? Starting, great <laughs> From your starting perspective. Point. Yeah. Well, I think we live in a world where we obviously are told constantly that being of service is what is most important. And I personally believe that it's the opposite. And that is not to say that I don't believe we should be of service because I do believe we should be. But I don't believe that we can truly be of service unless we are first and foremost self-loyal to ourselves. Um, as you mentioned in my bio, I come from a lifetime um, of adverse situations which began very, very early. Um, it included child abuse and domestic violence. And I realized that when I was very young, I had this inner compass, if you will. And I guess you could say it was part imagination and part intuition. And together, they were kind of like the guiding force of my self-loyalty. When I saw these things happening around me, I had to disassociate from them. And I had to choose myself in these situations. Um, that that self-loyalty that came about then was just this commitment to my own needs, to my own self-preservation in this understanding internally that if I loved myself most and if I took care of myself most, then everything else would fall into place. And I found that, especially while writing my book, when I looked back at all of these episodes over my life, that was the one theme that was threaded through everything is that no matter how difficult the situation got, it was that self-loyalty, that intuition, that inner compass that eventually reared itself and showed me the way again, back to loving myself most, back to putting my own needs first so that I could then give to the world. Yeah. Oh, I really love that definition of the giving back to yourself and taking care of your own needs. Like, I, I think there's a lot of uh, chatter, I think, about what is, um, what is that, right? Taking care of our needs versus, uh, you know, is it selfish? Is it, um, especially as women, right? We've been almost martyrs. To Absolutely. 
And, you know, I think there's a lot of misconception too. You know, a lot of times self-loyalty, self-care, self-love, those terms could be used interchangeably. And I think it's super important to understand that self-loyalty and self-care can be something as simple as stopping and giving yourself a nice, nice hot salt bath, but it can also be something as big as cutting ties from toxic family members who you no longer need to have sucking your energy in your life. So there's varying degrees and levels of it, but it's understanding and knowing when you yourself need to step in and give yourself what you need. Yeah. I love that. It's the whole, um, the, the, the talk about boundaries and, you know, what's acceptable when I think about that, you know, that self-care, I also think about what you think. Yeah. It's nice to take that bath or the candle, or maybe it's a pedicure or manicure or massage. Like all of that is definitely all self-love too, I think. But Mm -hmm. I also think it's when we start talking about our relationships with others, our relationship with ourselves of understanding, like what are our, our personal boundaries and how did you growing up in those situations come to realize like, how do you had, I mean, how did you learn about the boundaries then to be able to have that self, that self loyalty? And what did that look like? Well, as I mentioned, I grew up in a, in a pretty chaotic childhood. And so I had parents that I was very estranged from. Um, I, I should say we had on again, off again relationships to the point that when I was a young teenager, about 14 years old, I actually did emancipate myself from my family and became a ward of the court. Um, Luckily, I had a loving and endearing grandmother who helped take care of me when I did become that ward of the court. But I had parents who were severe alcoholics. And Um, I'm happy to say that my father eventually did quit drinking and has been sober for a long, long time, but that was not the case for my mother. I actually um, live in the town where I grew up and my mother, you know, still lived here most of my adult life. And she stayed on the trajectory of alcoholism to the point that she eventually drank herself to death from liver disease. One of the biggest boundaries and hardest boundaries that I ever made personally was that I had to cut the ties and detach from my mother because of the toxicity that her alcohol, her alcoholism brought to our family. And in the end, when she was dying, I had not spoken with her in I think about four years, even though she was just down the road. And of course, in the 11th hour, all of my family was coming to me saying, you need to go to her. You're going to regret this for the rest of your life. But in my mind, I had already made peace with the fact that I had this mother wound and I had this mother who couldn't love me. And I had said my goodbyes and I had wished her love from afar. And I chose to uphold the boundary that I would not go to her bedside in her death. And many people asked me about that afterwards Mm -hmm. and, and how I felt. And I cannot tell you how liberating and wonderful and beautiful it felt to give myself that gift. Here I had set myself up for it. I had told myself when this went down that I was gonna honor my choice. And instead of caving, I did. I stuck it out and I honored that choice. And I think since then, and even before then, it just became easier and easier to say, I'm doing this to sustain my energy. I'm doing this to sustain my self-loyalty. And sometimes that means making very hard decisions like that. Yeah. But what a choice to have been able to make that when you decided that you were no longer going to have this toxicity in your life that could just throw you probably for your own little mental loops. And then we come back, even with all of our tools, we come back and have to like almost pick ourselves back up from something that they didn't even think about. And one of the things that you mentioned and I, and I, that I wanted to point out was that you said you realized that she couldn't love you. That's a really powerful statement. And to be able to pull away from it and realize that, well, she didn't love herself. So how was she going to love you? You know, it's interesting you say that because it was my book writing journey that helped lead me on this trail of forgiveness, if you will. 
you know, obviously my whole life I had wondered, especially as a younger adult and a child, why can't she love me? Why doesn't she choose me? And in writing my story, I was able to, I guess you could call it, look at it from a different perspective. And I slowly began to forgive her when I came to terms with the fact that it was never about me. It was about her own demons, her own trauma, her own karma that she was dealing with, and that it was never really about me. And that is when the true healing you know, began. And I was able to go through this process of forgiveness so that I could stop blaming her so that I could stop feeling like the victim and really just coming to terms with, we're all just humans here on a different mission. And unfortunately, she had a mission that didn't include being a great mother to me. And I had to come to terms with that. And I wouldn't change it for the world because obviously it's made me the mother that I am. It's made me the person that I am. And I have to accept that that's what that lesson was all about. Yeah. You know, I know there's somebody listening who needs to hear that, Jill, Yeah, who needs to hear, you know, that those feelings of, you know, I'm sure there's rage in there too, at some point, right. Of the, the rage, the resentfulness, you know, to get to forgiveness that it wasn't even about you. It was about their own healing that needed to occur and unfortunately didn't happen with your mom. And so for those who are listening, I want them to realize that if you're in this situation or you grew up as a child or as an adult Mm -hmm. with somebody who's in a, a, whatever that looks like, whether it's alcoholism or drug addiction or gambling or all the merit of things that can happen out there, right. Of, of how they are self-medicating their own lives, their own pain, that it's never really about us. That, that, you know, that takes a really profound level of healing, Jill. And I want to acknowledge that you, I don't want to call it the work, but you did the work. Thank you. And I feel like that is ultimately part of the mission that comes from writing the book you know, initially when I sat down and began, it had nothing to do with others. It was about getting my story out of me, extracting it from inside, putting it into a monument or vessel of some sort, just so that I could feel lighter myself having it out of me. But in the writing process, I began to see the theme and how this could potentially help other people understand that when we step back and do that work, and kind of look at things from another perspective or another lens. And we do begin to see that it is not always just about us, that there's so many factors that that is when the true healing and forgiveness can begin. And so that's where my empowerment comes in. I ultimately think that that is what I'm being called to do, to share my story, not to point fingers, not to say, hey, look at what happened to me, but to say, hey, this is what happened to me. Here's the tools and lenses I used to look at it in a different way and get to the other side. And guess what? You can do it too. We can all take our lessons and find the silver lining, if you will. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That's a really big lesson. And that is a silver lining. You know, I grew up with a, um, well, I had a sister, she's deceased, but she had a drug addiction and she started really young with experimental things like a lot of kids do. And, Mm -hmm. um, And she, uh, you know, by the time she was 18, she was way out of our parents' house and I was older. So I was what, three or four years older now, but she, she, she lived until 42 before she, um, OD'd, right. I want to say almost say finally OD'd, but because she'd been struggling with it since she was like 15. Like I can relate to that. I have a sibling who is still you know, grew up in the same childhood chaos that I did and unfortunately did not choose the path that I did. And now is in his early forties and has been dealing with drug addiction and in in and out of jail his whole life. And so I understand that. I understand. I definitely can understand the setting, the boundaries. And um, at some point, because she brought multiple children, she has three sons and they were homeless. And I mean, you know, all this stuff. And I remember uh, people from the outside would always wonder, well, why don't you like take her boys? And I'm thinking, well, I, I I feel that they have pain, but 
that is not my journey. It's boundaries. I'm not inviting in more chaos into my son's life. I choose us. I choose my son's life. And I had never really thought about the term self-loyalty. And that's in fact what you were practicing because it's so quick for people to judge and make judgment on, well, why don't you? How come you are not doing this? But nobody ever has the full story. And so we really have to, you know, that's one of the things when my book first came out, the number of people who stepped forward and were like, oh my goodness, we had no idea. We knew this much, we had no idea. And, and that's kind of another theme is that we really truly don't understand what lies beneath the surface of everything, mm -hmm. but we are quick to judge. So yeah, I understand that completely. Yeah, you know, and kind of leads me to like, um, you've made a choice to have a sober lifestyle along with, it sounds like, like this whole spiritual awakening, which was part of what helped birth this, this wonderful book, you know, of when the apple falls far from the tree. Um, I would love to hear about that journey and how this all, you know, how this came about. Was it before the book or during the book or <clears throat> how, how did you, how did you make those choices for yourself? All right. Well, this is a great story in and of itself. So just prior to the pandemic, just, I mean, I want to say maybe five, six months before the pandemic, that's the first time that I had consciously decided I'm going to write a book. Now, my whole life, because I've had so many things happen, I would half jokingly say, I'm going to write a book someday. I'm going to write a book someday. <laughs> yeah. And if, if I wasn't the one saying it, it was like my neighbor or my best friend going, oh, you need to write a book. But of course, when I would say those words, I never in a million years imagined I was actually going to write a book. But lo and behold, several months before the pandemic came, I decided and I started with an outline. I had no idea what I was doing. I have never formally been trained as a writer. So I started Googling things like how to write a book. And, and then the pandemic hit. And oh, I, I have to mention just before the pandemic, when I made this decision is just about the same time that I decided to embark on the sobriety journey. So long story short, I had come from this family of alcoholics. I mean, literally my mother drank herself to death in her early 60s. Her sister drank herself to death in her early 60s. My father was a raging alcoholic, but then quit. So I knew that it was in my blood or in my family. But I always thought, oh, that'll never happen to me because I was like the good time drunk, the good time party girl. I had a great time. I was singing karaoke. It was all great. Whereas my parents... They were more of the darker drinkers. Things would turn into a fight. Things would turn violent. Things would be, you know, they'd be crying. That wasn't me. So I never saw it as a problem. But right about the same time when I started, made the decision to write my book, I realized that I was doing a lot more drinking and that it was getting a little bit worse and worse. Like one glass of wine at night was turning into a bottle. And I quickly decided I do not want to become my mother I don't want this to take over my life. And I bought into this little 90 day sobriety challenge. Well, little did I know buying into this 90 day sobriety challenge has now turned into the summer I just celebrated three years without any alcohol. And I did it number one, because I didn't want to turn out like my number, my mother. Number two, I had two grown daughters and I think they were seeing a little bit too much of this good time party mom. And I really wanted to set an example for them that you can still be the life of the party and have a great time without alcohol. And guess what? I will say I'm still doing a pretty darn good job of that. <laughs> so so as, I, as I was sober and writing this book, I guess I didn't realize just how much of the numbing that I had been doing with alcohol over the years, because now all of a sudden I had all my feelings right there at the forefront and I had no choice but to face them all head on. And that collision of getting sober and writing the book just came together in like harmony. And I had, as you said, a spiritual awakening. It happened to be that uh, the sobriety program I bought into from Rebecca Weller, who wrote the book, A Happier Hour, which is the sobriety book that prompted my sobriety. She would send these daily emails and these daily emails would always have 
um, a spiritual guru or some name or some quote that I would follow the little breadcrumbs. And it led, it led me into finding all of these discoveries like Louise Hay and these names that I had never heard of. And all of a sudden I was doing, you know, some guided meditations and I was doing some journaling and I was looking up these spiritual gurus and everything just happened so beautifully. I think that all that was transpiring at the same time, that sobriety, that awakening, that dealing with my feelings of the present and the past was just all part of the plan to help me heal and move forward. It was, it couldn't have been uh, constructed any better. Oh, the universe is beautiful that way, right? Like really, uh, I want to say synchronicities for those who are newer on their spiritual journey, but there really is none. It was just, you were ready. Divine timing. Yeah. The divine divine timing of there she is. She has realized, I mean, what a, what a way to, to pause for yourself to realize that even though you had never had those dark, that dark, I, I've been around plenty of that, um, myself and where those something simple ends up in this really not happy place. And it's, and then to realize that, no, I was like the life of the, you know, I was just having a good time, but then to realize that you have your own like epiphany that I'm a, the role model to these, these beautiful girls. And what if they come away from my house thinking that, what if they don't make that realization and they start down that path? Like, absolutely. That's a, a big responsibility, not only as a parent and a woman, but you know, everything that could, uh, that it could eventually lead to with, you know, the DNA. I, I do subscribe to the belief that, um, whether it's alcohol, you know, we'll use alcoholism, but that is, it's a, it's something that we carry through our DNA. I do subscribe to that as a medical addiction. Mm -hmm. And I do believe totally in generational trauma. And there's so much science mm-hmm. out there to, to, um, you know, back that now. And it is a matter of fact, mm-hmm. uh, just, I'm just going to give a little teaser. I'm actually writing my second memoir. I've already started because actually, since I published my first book, when the apple falls far from the tree, a whole lot has been uncovered and it goes right down to what you're saying in that, um, history likes to repeat itself. Let's face it. There's Mm -hmm. evidence. And in my family, it is very, very evident and very easy to see. And so I realized that I needed to be the cycle breaker. I needed to be the one to say, it stops with me. Let's stop this so that it's not just repeating generation after generation. Oh, I got tooth bumps. It stops with me. Like total all on people might call that goosebumps. I call them truth bumps. Um, And it, it is. I, I like you believe in the generational trauma. I believe in, in all of the research that is really, really stepping forward of how we carry that. You know, not yeah. only do you carry that gene to be much more susceptible to alcoholism, is that you also carry the trauma that comes with it. And we can normalize, like, this is how a household is without even realizing that there's something, yeah. maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's not two extremes of a spectrum either. Right. But that there's this in between that can still exist with yes. our own behaviors and beliefs. And we don't even realize that we're, we're carrying on that. Yes. And in writing my book, I realized like you said, that it stops with me. That's one of the things every time that I read a chapter back to myself as I was writing my manuscript, it was like I was saying that out loud, it stops with me. And then I'd write about the next thing and and I would be like, it stops with me. And so again, just being that cycle breaker, being the person who is willing to step up and say, we're going to talk about this. We're going to heal this. We're going to forgive this. And we're going to move on. And I realized that not everybody wants to live out loud like I do, but I truly believe that there is something to be said with owning that truth. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm, I know I'm human. I've made plenty of mistakes myself as a child and as an adult, but I've had to deal with them and I've had to forgive myself and be forgiven for, you know, choices that I've made. 
we, you know, there's that saying that what you resist persists. And I mean, mm-hmm. I just cannot preach that enough that if you ignore it, if you brush it under a rug, like I was basically taught by both sides of my family, we don't talk about that. We don't mention that. Don't you bring that up that you're not healing and resolving anything when you go through life with that philosophy. And I want to be the person to say, let's pull out these skeletons, let's call them what they are, and let's move on from it. Yeah, that's really powerful. Willing to talk about this. And it's like, are you from the South? Like with my, my, my heritage comes from the South, right? And they're, you know, with their generational trauma, I realized in my own family was that it wasn't, I think there's some alcoholics stuff in there that my mom seems to carry, but I don't, um, but I didn't grow up around about with that. Right. I, I -hmm. had more of the, the cycles of, we don't talk about things. We just don't, right? Like that real, Mm -hmm. almost a traditional South, that is just stuff that happens over there. It's about appearances. Um, We don't want to be too emotional. We don't, you know, so you can see like, um, I had a therapist on and and I said, well, what happens to us, whether you're in a traumatic home, like you, Jill, or the Mm -hmm. non-traumatic? And and I said, why do we still have stuff that we have to work through? Well, I think we all have generational trauma we all have situational stuff that we grow up in and they all collide. Well, and and that's just it. You nailed it. We all have it. Even if you don't think you had it, trust me, you do. I mean, something as simple as one of the things that my mother used to do when I was a child is squash my emotions. Like when I got hurt, she would say to me, oh, stop it. You're fine. Oh, stop it. You're going to be just fine. Be a big girl. And I realized I said the same thing to my daughter's. When they would get hurt, I wouldn't give them that time to be relish in the fact that they were hurt. I would be like, oh, you're fine. Come on, honey, suck it up. And it wasn't until I had the spiritual awakening and I started to do my work that I realized, wow, I mean, I really brought a lot of those traits with me. And while they may be grown now and I can't go back and reverse that, how wonderful that I now know that I do that and I can consciously correct myself. And that I can have a conversation with them and say, I'm sorry, I didn't acknowledge your pain more. You know, your feelings are your compass. I should have allowed you to feel them more. Wow. And you know what? So um, that's really um, could be very shifting for a lot of relationships, you know, mothers and their children, all of us with adult children. I know I said the same thing because I was told the same thing too. Like uh, Mm -hmm. children are seen and not heard. Um, I think these are really common for those of us. I grew up in the seventies and super, super common, but I raised, my son was born in 1990 and I was still repeating these things, Mm -hmm. you know, guilty, guilty here as well. Mm -hmm. And that's just a real common one, right? Like, Oh, right. Or if you're crying, you know, I'll give you something to cry about. Oh, exactly. And we don't realize the ramifications, if you will, of that. And the other thing is that there's so much um, scientific proof now out there about how much we really take in from birth to about six, seven years old, you know, and a lot of these parents back then and even now have this stance that, oh, they're young, they won't remember. But of course, if you read my book, you will find out that we do remember and our memory goes back a lot Mm -hmm. further than you think it does. And, you know, these traumas stay with us. Yeah. You know, there is so much, uh, so much proof. And I, I feel like I just had this conversation with somebody, but you know, the body remembers, you know, all of the stuff, Louise Hayes, I think is one of the first people that I think the spiritual world heard about with, um, that we, we then take that trauma and it comes, Store it. Mm-hmm. it stores it in our body and you are a cancer survivor and your body did remember it. It did store mm-hmm. it and it showed up and it manifested in something. And luckily you were able to work through and get to the other end of it. And you know, I, I don't particularly care for the, 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 the term that I'm battling, you know, cancer. Agreed. Agreed. I, I, I just don't think because some of people lose the battle and I, 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 I don't know what words we need to use to replace that. 
but yeah, there's got to be something better. I know thriving through cancer. It's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing, but you're right. It's funny. Um, I always said, if I ever were to pass away, I don't, I don't want my obituary to say after a long battle with cancer, because I'll be damned if that's, what's going to take me down. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And my sister is, uh, she just finished up treatment. She had, she actually had cancer this year and now that she's gone through her chemo, she has a whole year of these other treatments so that it doesn't come back because it has um, a right, 60% right. chance of coming back for her, her specific type. And we were, um, we were, um, and she's not like me, like who I'm like, Hey, let's do some energetic healing and all of this, but she started, they're starting to become open to it. Like, okay, well let's nice. look at what that is, but there's so many different references, right. Of where we can then go on a spiritual path of opening ourselves up to depending on what type of cancer, the types of questions we can ask ourselves and dig into and help our body uh, release it and heal the self-healing that can happen. It's funny you should say that because if you ask me, and even in the book, I basically say that my spiritual awakening happened about three years ago when my sobriety journey began. But in retrospect, I truly think it was eight years ago when the cancer came is when I really started tuning in, tapping back into that uh, inner child, that little Jill that lived within who was trying to come out. Because as I outline in my story, there was a great portion of my adult life where I forgot about that inner compass, that self-loyalty. And, you know, it was this later years, most recently, that it has resurfaced. And I'm so happy to welcome uh, that self-loyalty and that intuition back into my life. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if somebody is thinking about, okay, self-loyalty, I'm looking at my life now. Do you have, and you probably outlined it in the book, is you know, how do we start to begin to understand where some of those boundaries should be? Were there questions that you started to think about or you've outlined that somebody listening could go, oh, you know, do I not have this for myself? I think the the thing that we need to do is, as humans, we all seek evidence. And one of the things that I had to do, and it ended up happening through the writing of my book is, you know, we feel self-defeated at times. We think we haven't accomplished things. We think we're not strong enough. But when I went back and I made that actual timeline of my life and I saw the evidence there that, wow, you got through this and here's what you did. Wow, you got through this and here's what you did. That was the, the beginning of my awareness, if you will. We all kind of are just going through the motion of this day-to-day living, and we're not really present in the moment. We're not really aware of things. And I think that my suggestion to people would be to, you know, you don't have to go out and write a book you're going to publish, but start writing, start jotting some things down, make a timeline of your life, give yourself some evidence of things that have happened and in adversities that you've gotten through. Think back to what was it that got me through that? You know, when we're going through these tough times, sometimes we think, oh, my God, I'm I'm not going to get to the other side of this. And then we do. And we don't give ourselves enough credit for the fact that we made it through something that was very difficult. But I think that when somebody takes that time to get fully self-aware, kind of go back through their timeline and give themselves that proof and that evidence, that that is what builds the power to move forward in knowing that guess what? You did it before and you can do it again. I I'm writing that down because it really is a, a gift to yourself to be able to do that. You know, that's so interesting. I had never really thought about that. Like doing an outline. I, when I used to scrapbook, when my son was like in middle school, I sat down and I did a timeline, right? Cause I had all like totes and totes of pictures, child, my own childhood, his childhood, and he's in middle school at this point. And I wanted to preserve some of the, the moments. And so I started a, a basic line with years and I started adding up like different things that were happening, but that was like 
my goodness, that's like two year 2000. And here it is another 22 years have passed. And I think, <laughs> wow, I should go back. Like what a powerful exercise to be able to go back and really help you realize like your own tenacity, your own resilience to do hard things. Like uh, Glennon Doyle says, right. You can, we can do hard things. Yes. And we don't give ourselves enough credit for what we have done. And any of us can sit down and create a, a timeline trajectory of our life, obviously. And it's also great because not only are you looking back, but this kind of helps you keep your eye on the prize of moving forward, you know, without losing touch with the here and now, because, you know, in all of my spiritual mm -hmm. work, obviously I've realized that it's really not about the past, although the past has shaped me. And it's not really about the future, although I do have goals and aspirations. It's about enjoying the abundance, the abundance that is here with me right now. Yeah. Being present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being I'm working present. hard on that every day. Yeah. Oh, me too. I would say, I think it's a, um, you know, I think when we go to share our, these lessons that you've learned, there's this balance of learning of like, yeah, this, all of this stuff has happened and you, and you have a message to share to help so that it will, whoever it's going to resonate with, will find hope and inspiration to keep going that they too can do hard things and, and that they have tenacity and resilience built into them and yet move forward with right. being present. I, I think it's, it's this balance of of, it is. You know, it's a tough fine line. Yeah. 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 Of working through the stuff, but not getting stuck into it, you know, and, and I'm sure as you were going through that process too, um, there were moments that you found, you could have found yourself stuck. Um, oh, absolutely. As you're go going through that. And how did you help yourself then, you know, kind of like figure out at that point, am I stuck or am I still working through some of this stuff? How, you know, how did that I, look for you? I think it looks like a work in progress still. Like even today, I know mm -hmm. that I've done, I've done so much work with self-awareness, looking back, understanding, forgiving, but it's definitely still a work in progress. You know, I think uh, I've climbed the mountain quite a bit, but there's still, you know, there's still stuff I have to work through. And I think that's the other thing we have to come to terms with is that life is never meant or going to be idle. There's always going to be something, whether it's with you, your spouse, your child, your career, there's going to be a hurdle. You know, you just know you get through one and you kind of have that sigh of relief and you're just waiting. And I'm not saying, oh, you know, let's just spend our lives waiting for the other shoe to drop. What I'm saying is, don't expect everything to be sunshine in, in rainbows because there's always going to be something there because we are meant to evolve. We are meant to grow. We are not meant to be idle. And so we can count on it basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good reminder because there are even times where I find myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've just done so much work and I've evolved. And every year from this year, from last year, my goodness, like not only is the, the, the earth spinning differently because the earth is changing its vibration, but the impact on my life and, and everything that's happened that sometimes I can forget that yeah, this is yet like, how are you going to walk through this with grace? Right, right. How, how can, what tools do you have that you can, now... what are you going to call on? Yeah. Yeah. What, what are you going to call on? Yeah. I love that saying, like, look at it as um, what are you growing through versus what are you going through? Because yeah, life is, um, life is one big growth spurt. <laughs> right. Right. And choosing, right. Making the, the choice to be present and live with gratitude for where we are today. It's nice that we can look back and we have lessons and we can share how can we help some, you know, pull somebody up with us, but we still move forward and there's still going to be uh, other beautiful experiences. And then some that are just not as a uh, rainbow and uh, unicorny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The sooner we accept that the greater life will be. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. That acceptance. Yeah. I'm a, 
I've come to realize that uh, a lot of the themes with uh, my guests has been this inner acceptance. And Beautiful. if uh, so, I'm so glad that our paths have crossed, you know, and that you're able to bring forth, you know, this whole different view of like what, what self-loyalty is and how we show up in your own awakening and the growth to move forward. It's very inspirational, Jill. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I actually did just finish a six month life um, coach course. Um, I'm not current. I'm not currently doing any coaching, but I can see that that's where I'm being called. That is in my trajectory. So sometime in the near future, I hope to help um, other people who may be in the same situation as myself, women, midlifers, who, you know, just need to reflect back on how resilient and strong they are and give themselves a little credit and, mm -hmm. you know, keep moving forward. Yeah. I, I love all of that. Now, if somebody wants to reach you, Jill, how can they connect with you? Well, I can be found at justbeingjill.com. There mm -hmm. are tabs up there. You can shoot me an email on there. There's also a tab up there that has um, links to purchasing my book, which again is called When the Apple Falls Far From the Tree. It's published under my pen name, Margot Riley. And uh, if you subscribe to my um, newsletter, you also get chapter one for free of the book. So if you put in your just your name and your email, your listeners, they can get the first chapter of the book for free and see if it's something that's interesting. You can also go on to Amazon. Um, they obviously have a little bit there and it's been getting some great reviews. So if anybody does grab it and read it, I hope that you will leave a review. Everything yeah. is right there on my website. I, I love that. I was reading your blog. And you were talking about your uh, alter ego with having your author's pen name. And um, I'm not going to share too much with it because I want people to go read it. It's actually really uh, a beautiful story about, you know, the whole pen name and, and how we all have it. And, you know, we all have an alter ego. We just don't realize it, but we're stepping into lots of roles all day long. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So I will include all of that here in the show notes. We'll include a link even for people to go get it, to go uh, pick up the book and where they can go even pick up the free, you know, first chapter and see if it resonates with something that they want to go do. But uh, thank you, Jill, for being here. It's just been such an honor to get to know you and share, you know, the magic that you are bringing out and birthing into the world. And uh, I feel fortunate as, as, as you step into more of a coaching role, you know, down the line that the people who will find you and that you will resonate and be their person. So thank you for doing all of that work for yourself. It, it really is the beginning point of where you are today. So feel very oh, blessed. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting me be here and be a guest amongst your listeners. I'm truly honored. Thank you. Thank you.